particularly my JJ gang. I hope everyone's okay. Okay, so I'm just going to give you a brief overview of strabismus. It's a very basic presentation, and um, I hope you, are, you guys enjoy it as much as I enjoy presenting this. So what is my presentation going to be like? So we're going to begin with history taking in strabismus, vision, motor examination, which means extraocular movements and cover tests, sensory examination, which means fusion and stereopsis, retinoscopy, which is an integral part of any squint examination, and don't forget the fungus. So let's begin with the history taking. So most important first is, what is the age of the patient at onset? So sometimes, like, why is that important? For example, uh, this, this question itself gives you a clue as to what you're dealing with. For example, if you come across a child who has an isotropia and the age of the patient at onset has been six months, then you know that it's probably an infantile isotropia. Whereas if you come across a patient whose parents say that the squinting was noticed at two or three years of age, and it has been intermittent, then you know that it's probably an accommodative piece of work. Who noticed the squint first? This question is very important because a lot of times uh, you may come across an intermittent squint. So when the parents come and uh, they bring the child and say that, I think my child's eyes are squinting, uh, and you don't see the squint, but still believe the parents because you're probably seeing the child for like 10 minutes in the OPD, but the parents are seeing the child all the time. So always believe the parents, give them the benefit of doubt. Mode of onset, is it a sudden onset squint or is it gradual onset? Again, gradual, more than gradual, whether it's intermittent or whether it's happened over a period of time. Sudden onset squints, more likely to be paralytic squints. You have acute onset esotropia, common cause for an acute onset esotropia are posterior cerebral, uh, posterior fossa lesions. So that again gives you a clue as to what you're dealing with. Again, sudden onset squint, myasthenia, can give rise to a sudden onset deviation in absence of a ptosis, which I deviates. Why is this question important? Because it tells you that which is the dominant eye, the nature and direction of the deviation. Bahar jata hai, andar jata hai, upar jata hai, ki niche jata hai. Again, that gives you a clue. You're dealing with isotropia, exotropia, hypo or hypotropia. Whether the squint is more from near or distance. So that means you ask a question like when, when the child is squinting, you observe the squint more when he's playing or do you notice it more when he's daydreaming? The, again, this gives you a clue because squint exotropias are generally more for near, uh, exotropias are generally more for distance, but not always. But this is the, uh, the, ma the majority presents like this. What are the precipitating factors? So it could be a high fever, it could be convulsions, it could be a simple trauma. So it's important to ask for precipitating factors. So uh, I'm going to take, this was a quiz question, which I'm going to take later at the end, okay? So history continued. Uh, many a times, you know, we forget to ask the history of uh, previous treatment. Now, this is very important, and I'll tell you why. Sometimes in JJ Hospital itself, uh, the parents don't like to tell that the child has been operated once, so the patient doesn't, hides that history. Then when I take up the patient on table, and if I have not been able to do a split lamp examination before, which does happen many times in children, it's not possible, you suddenly see a scar of surgery, and then your whole treatment plan changes. So it's very important to ask for history of any previous ocular surgery. Ocular surgery, why? Because we know, we've seen, Sumit and I have seen patients where a pterygium surgery has been attempted and the medial rectus has been um, cut by mistake or inadvertently cut. So that is important. Mm -hmm. Previous squint surgery, because I want to know how much the muscle is recessed or resected. Any ambulatory treatment, any patching treatment, I want to know because I want to know whether the squint is alternating or not alternating. Birth history, very important. Why is the birth history relevant? Because we have seen that patients who are premature or preterm or who are born with an IDF uh, process or are twins who have delayed milestones, they are the ones who have a greater risk of developing a screen. Family history, again, comes very important. Here's a picture on the side. You have a father and a child, both with bilateral ptosis and bilateral prosenine movement. So what they have is a congenital fibrosis syndrome father, son, both having the same thing. So that's the reason why you want to know the family history. The next thing, the first important thing when you start evaluating your squint is you notice a head posture. How do you notice the head posture? When you're observing a squint, never be in a hurry to start examining the squint per se. First, just simply observe the patient, ask him to look at a distant snell and start, and that's where it will pick up the head posture. Why is the head posture important? Because 
if the patient has a head posture, it tells you that the child is trying to maintain a field of binocular single vision and place it centrally. And uh, usually children who have a head posture are not amblyopic. The next thing, start examining the patient. Now again, when you're examining the patient, don't be in a hurry. First, try and see the vision binocularly. Why do you have to try and see the vision binocularly? Because that's the time that you'll pick up the head posture of any. So then the, after seeing the patient and observing the vision binocularly, then you start testing it monocularly. Now, when you're patching the child, make sure that the child is not peeking. Like if you see this first picture, the child is peeking and cheating. So although you might think that you're seeing the monocularly, you're testing the vision monocularly, the child may be actually seen from the other eye. So a good idea ideally would be to patch the eye like this, but again, in our general OPD setting, this all is not possible. So basically just make sure that the child's eye is covered well or make the child sit on the mother's lap, make the parent cover the child's eye. Again, this is a time to notice if the child has any nystagmus. If it has, then you've got to document it. Now, whenever we are, you know, you might have heard this term called CSM. So what is a CSM term? C stands for central, S stands for steady, M stands for maintain. So central versus eccentric fixation, steady versus unsteady, which means steady means no nystagmus, unsteady means there is nystagmus, maintained versus unmaintained. If the fixation of the uh, eye is maintained, it means less likely chances of amblyopia. If the fixation is unmaintained, that means the child is definitely amblyopic. When you talk of maintain fixation, you've got to say maintain for a few seconds, maintain for a few minutes or more than few minutes. So if the child is maintaining fixation for more than few minutes, that means the vision is very good. If the child is maintaining for a few seconds or just a minute, that means there is maybe a mild to moderate amblyopia. This is how you would examine a child, a preschool child or a school going child. You either can use uh, these kind of charts. So you have the regular Snellen charts, you have the E charts, you have the Evo TV. This is your Landolt seeding chart. This is the Lear symbol, this is the Allen charts. What I practically use in my OPD is a uh, Lear symbol chart. So I have a Lear symbol chart from here as well as for distance, which I have fixed in my Snellen's box. And this was a quiz question. What is this? Identify this. We'll take that later. So we finished with history taking. We finished with uh, uh, the vision taking. Now we come to extraocular movements. So before we go how to test the extraocular movements, we need to familiarize ourselves with certain terms. So ductions, versions, and virgins. Ductions are monocular movements. For example, supraduction, eye moving up, infraduction, abduction, adduction. The second terminology we need to know is version, so levoversion, dextroversion, that means binocular conjugate movements in the same direction. That means if I'm moving my eyes to the left like this, that is levoversion. If I'm moving my eyes to the right, it is dextroversion. The third terminology, convergence. Virgins are binocular Disconjugate movements in opposite direction. That means convergence or divergence. These are the only two vergences you can have. You cannot have supra and infravergence. Again, before we test, the uh, learn how to test the extraocular movements, you need to know the nine cardinal positions of gaze. So if you take a look at this picture, this is the primary gaze. And then when we're testing the extraocular movements, you don't ask the patient to look up and down. You have to ask the patient to either adduct the eye and look up. So when you're doing this, you're testing, you come back, you're testing the inferior oblique in the right eye and the superior rectus in the left eye. That means if you're asking the patient to look in this direction, this eye is adducted, this eye is abducted. So elevation in, in adduction, you're testing the inferior oblique then elevation in abduction, you're testing the superior rectus for the left eye. So that means the inferior oblique and superior rectus are a pair of yoke muscles. Similarly, in this case, when, you're, when you ask the patient to look in this direction, here you're testing the lateral rectus, here you're testing the medial rectus, that means the left medial rectus and the right lateral rectus are a pair of yoke muscles. Similarly, 
you need to know this that the right inferior rectus and the right uh, left superior oblique are a pair of yoke muscles. So you need to know this nine cardinal positions of gaze, which will help you to evaluate the uh, extra ocular movements. Again, introduction, you need to know these in two important laws in strabismus. One is the Sherrington's law and the other is the Herring's law. Sherrington's law states that when the agonist is contracting, the antagonist is relaxing. For example, if your medial rectus in the right eye is contracting, then same time the lateral rectus in the right eye has to relax. But there's an exception to this law and the only exception to this law is a Duan's co-contraction syndrome where you have simultaneous contraction of the, uh, of the medial rectus and the lateral rectus in the same eye. And that is the reason why in Duan's co-contraction syndrome, you have an end of the eye is pulled inside. Now, similarly, you have the Herring's law. So what is the Herring's law? It states simultaneous and equal innovation to synergist muscles. So the exception again here is BVD. What is the importance of this Herring's law? Practical importance is based on the Herring's law, you have the sequelae in paralytic strabismus. That is uh, the paralysis of the agonist muscle, the overaction of the antagonist, the inhibitional palsy. How do you know which muscle? It's all based on the Herring's law. We will not discuss paralytic strabismus here. That's a whole different lecture. But these two laws are basics in strabismus which you should know. These are common viva questions as well. Exceptions of the law are also viva questions. Exception of a Herring's law is BDD. Now coming to extraocular movements. So there is a mnemonic that you should remember when you're testing the extraocular movements. SYNRAD. SYNRAD stands for superiors in taut recti adduct. So for example, when you're, although the action of, uh, what is the action of the superior rectus muscle? To remember that, you have to remember this SYNRAD pneumonia. So superior rectus, so superiors in taut, therefore superior rectus is in torsion. This much you'll have to remember that the superior rectus causes elevation of the eye and the tertiary action of the superior rectus is adduction. Why? Because the recti adduct. So similarly, for inferior oblique, it is elevation because superiors, uh, so, so that this the elevation and depression you'll have to remember. Huh? So inferior oblique is elevation, recti adduct, so obliques abduct. So therefore, the other action of inferior oblique uh, uh, is abduction. And the, and the primary action is extortion because superiors intort, so inferiors extort. So now similar example, superior oblique is depression, intortion, and abduction. So if you remember superiors intort, recti adduct, that's how you will figure out the extraocular movements. But remember, when you're testing the extra, now this is the action of the muscle, but when you're testing the superior rectus, you actually have to abduct the eye and then elevate. When you're testing the inferior rectus, you have to abduct the eye and depress. When you're testing the obliques, you've got to adduct the eye and elevate for the inferior oblique. For the superior oblique, you have to adduct the eye and depress. So remember this. This is important. Huh? Don't mix up the action of the muscle and how you have to test it. This is just what I want you that when you're checking the recti, you actually have to abduct the eyeball. When you're checking the obliques, you've got to adduct the eyeball. Now let's take an example here. We have extraocular muscle testing. Now, when you're testing a common mistake, which I see postgraduate, the adduction abduction is not difficult. But what I see commonly postgraduates making a mistake is that when you're testing the elevation and depression, you simply ask the patient to look up and you ask the patient to look down. No, that's wrong. When you want to test the elevation and, and depression, you either got to abduct or you have got to adduct, then you've got to elevate and you've got to depress. So like in this, this patient, what are we testing in her right eye and what are we testing in the left eye? This is based on your nine cardinal positions of gaze, which I just revised with you. So we'll go through this again. In the right eye, I'm testing the inferior oblique. In the left eye, I'm abducting the eye and elevating and therefore I'm testing the superior rectus. Similarly, in this direction, I'm testing in the right eye, I'm testing the superior rectus, whereas in the left eye, I'm testing the inferior oblique. Similarly, when I have to test the down gaze, I'm not going to ask the patient to simply look down. 
I'm going to adduct the eye and abduct the eye and then test for the depression function. So here I'm testing the inferior rectus, whereas here into the left eye I'm testing the superior oblique. When I do this, I'm testing the uh, superior oblique in the right eye and in the left eye I'm testing the inferior rectus. Now this is the primary gaze of the patient when you see that this child has ptosis. Now again, this was a question which I'm going to take later, right? So, Mitch, should we'll take it later, right? The questions. Ma'am, yeah, questions we'll take in the end. Okay, so we'll we'll come back to this. Okay, yes. these are all just questions. Okay, so we finish the first part, which is history taking. We finish the second part, which is vision, and now we come to the third part. I've introduced you to some laws. We understood how to test test the extraocular movements. Now we come to the fourth part. So again, before we start to cover tests, we need to familiarize ourselves with two important terms. One is tropia and the second is toria. So squint, when, when you call it tropia, it's a manifest squint. So manifest squint is called as a tropia. That means when you look at the patient, you will see a visible squint. That means when the patient walks into the OPT, you're pursuing the patient for history and you see a visible squint, either an exo or an eso or a hypo. Or a hypo. What is a latent squint? Latent squint is also called as a phoria. This means that when you see the patient, the eyes look straight. But when you break the fusion by doing the alternate cover test, the squint becomes evident. So phoria means a hidden squint. The squint will not be visible to you. Many a times, or some of you may have seen that patients with intermittent divergent squint, as and when you're talking to the patient, the eye moves in and out like a pendulum. So these again are large phoria. So now this is a picture to show you what a manifest squint is and a latent squint. So if we take a look at this picture, I'm looking at this picture without me doing anything. The patient has a visible squint. So this patient has a left exotropia. Now, if you take a look at this child, this child, when she was talking, the eyes are straight, but the parents say, no, my child has a squint, I'm seeing a squint. So we do the alternate cover test, break the fusion, and on breaking the fusion, you see that the left eye has deviated out. So therefore, this makes it a phoria. Now, coming to the first part of the motor examination, and this test is what we all commonly do in our OPD, and this is called as the Hirschberg test. So what is this Hirschberg test? It measures the deviation of the corneal light reflex from the center of the pupil. So this everybody I think would know. We use the torch, we're looking at the patient, we're shining the torch like this and we see the position of the light reflex from the center of the pupil. Now one millimeter of decentration corresponds to seven degrees of ocular deviation. So when you see a pupillary reflex at the, at, uh, sorry, when you see the light reflex at the pupil margin, it is approximately 15 degrees. If you see it at the limbus, it is approximately 45 degrees between the pupil margin and the limbus to then calculate approximately 30 degrees like this, what you see in this picture. So this would be the normal. If you see it at the pupillary border, it means it's 15 degrees. If you see it somewhere in between the pupillary border and the limbus, it would probably be 30 degrees. And if you see it at the limbus or a little beyond the limbus, it would mean 45 degrees. Another important term is that when a lot of us talk in terms of degrees, but many of us talk in terms of prisms. So one degree is equal to two prisms. So if you see a 15 degree uh, squint, it would mean 30 prism. 30 degrees is equal to 60 prisms, 45 degrees is equal to 90 prisms. So that is something that you need to remember. Now we come to the cover test. So cover test comes as a short note in your exams. Motor examination may come as a full question in your exam. If they ask you motor examination, then you're supposed to talk about extraocular muscle actions and how you're going to test them. Mention about nine cardinal positions of gaze. And then you start talking about your cover test. Now your cover test has three components. One is the cover test, second is the uncover part of the test, and third is your prison bar alternate cover test. The cover test is used to detect tropias. I familiarize with you that term tropia means manifest twin. Uncover test is used to elicit a phoria. Phoria means latent twin. And prison bar alternate cover test is used to measure or quantitate the amount of squint. So again, 
just to revise with you, it is used to detect true pairs. Remember, all your cover tests have to be performed for distance and for near. What will you use for distance? Your target for distance will be your Snellens chart. What will be what will you use for near? So use an accommodative target, for example, a Snellens near. Sorry. Use an accommodative target, for example, either you have a Snellens near chart. Or you use a simple toy with fine details. Commonly, you'll see uh, us using in the OPT what we use in, uh, is a pencil, and on top of the pencil, I put a toy. Or if I have an ice cream stick, I've, I've made some stickers on that ice cream stick. Or if I have finger puppets, I put the puppet on the finger and I ask the um, child to look, stare at the nose or, or to stare at the uh, eyes of that uh, animal. Ideally speaking, okay, you're supposed to do the cover test in all the nine gazes. Because why you want to do it? Because if your angle of the squint is not the same in all the cases, that means there is some paralytic element to it. Now it's easier said than done. I myself, I mean, although you know, I've written here nine cases, I myself do not. I practically I don't measure in all the nine cases, but I really yes, you're supposed to at least mention that you're going to make you you like to measure in nine cases in your exam. But the most important gaze is your, um, you know, when you're looking for vertical squints, up gaze and down gaze. Also, when you want to uh, elicit an A pattern or a B pattern, you've got to know up gaze and down gaze. Hmm? Now, how do you perform this test? You cover the patient's apparently fixing eye. Look for the movement in the other eye. That means, for example, suppose if my, uh, this eye has an exotropia. Then when I ask you to do the cover test, I'm going to cover my this eye, which is my fixing eye. This eye has exotropia. This is my fixing eye. I'm going to cover this eye. When I cover this eye, I have to see what happens to this eye. So if this eye moves towards the center, from outside from to the center, I have an exotropia. Suppose if my eye moved from the uh, nose towards the center, I have an esotropia. If the movement has been upwards, that means from up to the center, then it is a hypertropia. Down to the center, it is a hypotropia. So now, which eye will you cover in this case? Now see, this patient has a manifest squint. He has an isotropia. So which eye will you cover? You will cover this eye when you're doing the cover test. Now similarly, if the patient has an exotropia, like you see in this picture, the right eye has an exotropia. So which eye are you going to cover? You're going to cover the left eye. And when you cover the left eye, this eye will move to the center to take up fixation. Similarly, when you cover this eye, this eye moves from the nose towards the center to take up fixation. So that's your cover test. What's the alternate cover test? So the alternate cover test reveals the total amount of deviation. So you cover the fixing eye and then you quickly shift the occluder to the other eye. And then do it several times. I've seen this is very easy. Everybody does this in the OPD. Okay. So that's your alternate cover test. Once you've removed the cover, you note the speed of recovery as the eye returns back to the pre-dissociated state. Now, I will show you a video of how to do the alternate cover test. So just take a look at this video. Just a minute, huh? Okay. Maybe two minutes. Yes, ma'am. No problem. I guess only it was working, man. <laughs> uh, it's okay, ma'am. We. Uh, I'll show you the video in the yeah. end after yes. I minimize it. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So now, like I just I told you that in in the cover test you look for the movement. Right? So now suppose if I have a right exotropia, I have covered my left eye, and normally what would I expect this exotropic eye to come to the center and take up fixation? But what if you see no movement? That means that you've covered the wrong eye. So you've got to cover the other eye and look for the movement. Second possibility is that the patient's fixation is eccentric and therefore no movement. Third possibility is that you made a mistake. The patient does not have a tropia. So you do the uncover test to rule out a phobia. And if still there is no movement, then probably the patient does not have a swing. Now this is quite unlikely, 
but these three possibilities are definitely there. What is an alternating spin? So lot, again, a lot of times you will see patients or students in the OPD doing this. Ah, either they go, either they go, and the eye is moving like this, like alternately, and then they say, okay, this is an alternating squint, madam. So I ask them, what is the vision? Right eye vision is 660, left eye vision is 660. This itself is a clue. If you have so much of disparity between the vision where right eye is 660, right eye is exotropic, left eye vision is 660, this cannot be an alternating squint. So what is an alternating squint? When the squinting eye is able to maintain central fixation, in spite of removing the cover from the opposite eye, the squint is said to be alternating. So now, for example, this patient has a left exotropia. So if you have to do the cover test, you will cover the right eye. Now, if once you've covered the right eye, okay, the left eye has come to the center and it is taking fixation. Now I have removed the cover. See, I have removed the cover from the right eye. The left eye continues to maintain fixation. This is an alternating squint. Okay? Just doing covering like this, like this, and doing an alternate cover test is not an alternating squint. Another hint I have told you that if the squint is truly alternating, the vision should be more or less equal. If the vision is more or less equal, the squint is usually an, or mostly an alternating squint. If you find that, let's say, the right eye has 618, the left eye has 66 vision, the right eye has an exotropia. Probably the right, it will still be an alternating squint with moderate amount of amyloidia. Okay, but if you have a 660, then less likely that this squint is alternating. So the vision will give you a clue. Now in this patient, is this an alternating squint? So see, now he, she has an exotropia, sorry, an exotropia in the right eye. So what have I done? I have covered the fixing eye. Left eye is the apparently fixing eye. So if I've covered the left eye, this patient, instead of looking to the center, the eye helps, she's looking more exotropic. That means this is not an alternating squint. This is a right esotropia with poor fixation. Okay, and if you very easy, you've got a mature cataract in this eye. Now, uncover test. The uncover test is used to detect phorias or, you know, basically intermittent squints or latent squints. So what you have to do here is you have to cover one eye. You can cover any eye. So remember what I told you for an uncover test that both the, the patient walks in with no skin. Both eyes will look straight. So either I can cover the right eye or I can cover the left eye. What you have to do is when I've covered, suppose the right, uh, suppose my right eye, I have to look at what has happened to my eye under the cover. So I cover this eye and I quickly remove the cover. And then I see what has happened to the eye under the cover. So when you've uncovered it, if the eye has deviated out and it moves to the center, it's an exophoria. If the eye moves in, it is an esophoria. If the eye moves from up to the center, it is a hypophoria. And down to the center, it is hypophoria. So in what is the difference between the cover test and the uncover test? In a cover test, I'm looking for the movement in the other eye. Okay, again, cover test, this eye has exotropia. I'm covering this eye and I'm seeing what is happening to this eye. What fixation it's taking in this eye, the open eye. The uncover eyes, both my eyes are straight. I can cover the right eye. I can cover the left eye. And I have to look for the movement, not in this eye. But I have to look at what happens to this eye when I quickly remove the cover. Now comes the alternate prism test. I have a video for all these three and if it doesn't work during the presentation, I'll show it to you in the end. So now cover test, uh, the alternate cover test by itself has no meaning, but it has to be combined with prisms. So either you can use loose prisms or you can use a prism bar. What does it do? It measures the total deviation. When do we do it? We do it when we're planning surgery or when we need to document the angles. Remember, cover tests have to always be performed with the patient's glasses or contact lenses in place. So what's the end point of your prism cover test? When you see no movement or a reversal of movement, that's the time that the, that's your end point. What is the most important care that you should take when you're doing this? Patient should not be allowed to establish binocularity during the alternate covering. That means at no time should, should when you're doing the alternate cover test with the prism, at no time you should allow the patient to quickly fuse. And then you have the Krimsky's test. 
What is the Klinsky's test? It is done in a patient where the cover test is not possible. So there are certain prerequisites for a cover test. Most important prerequisite is that the patient has to have good vision because only then he's going to be able to concentrate on your Snellen's chart or look at your accommodative target. And second most important is that he has to have a central fixation. If he doesn't have a central fixation, how are you going to do the cover test? So what's the option? Viva question. What is the option if you can't do the cover test? Klinsky's test. So prisms of increasing power are placed before the fixating eye till the light reflex is centered in the deviating eye. So it's like this. This is your squint, okay? You place the prism in your fixing eye, which is your normal eye. And why am I putting it in this direction? Because it's an esophobia. So always the apex is towards the direction of the squint. You put increasing prisms till you see this reflex come to the center. So once this reflex has come to the center, whatever amount of prism that you put, that's your angle of swing. This is how a loose prism looks like. This is the apex of the prism. The thicker part is the base of the prism. And you have a number written here. So 40, this one is a 40 prism uh, diopter lens. You get 20, you get 15. There's a whole set of loose prisms. When you have large squints, you need to combine the squints. So this is how you would combine the squint. So for example, if this patient had an exotropia, whenever you're putting the prisms, remember again, the apex of the prism has to point towards the direction of the squint. So if you're putting an exotropia, this is the apex, this is the base. If you're combining, then either you can put a vertical and a horizontal on top of each other like this, or you can put a horizontal in this and a vertical in this. Okay. Suppose if it was a large angle squint and you had to split the prisms, then in that case, the direction will be the same. Apex out here also and apex out here also. This is the prerequisite for the cover test. Fixation needs to be central. You can't do it in patients with eccentric fixation. These are all viva questions. Patients have to be at least 660 or 636 for them to maintain a fixation. The test must be performed with patients' best corrected visual activity. That means, uh, you know, a lot of times when I'm doing the cover test, my resident or my uh, sister will tell me, Kashmani color. No. The cover test or whatever test you're going to do has to be done with patients' glasses or contact lenses in place. Most important thing, do not use a torch light in the cover test. If you're demonstrating or doing a cover test in, in front of the examiner, say that I'd like to use a accommodative target or I'd like to, I did the cover test with a patient fixating at the Snellen. Don't say that you did it with a torch light. You'll fail if you do that. Okay, so that this was a video. So... Let me just see. Okay, I'll show it to you in the end. Now, these are special situations. Uh, the first thing that you have to remember is that if the patient is wearing glasses and the glasses are very thick glasses, greater than five, uh, five diopters of myopia or something, then the glasses itself induces a prismatic effect. So there is a table that we have uh, this is, I, I think maybe this is not for PGs, but I'm just mentioning it. There's a table that we have, which uh, compensates for the amount of plus lenses or the minus lenses. But don't worry about this. I think this is not for PGs. And intermittent divergence wins with good fusion. Sometimes it's difficult to break the fusion. So there is a, a patch test that you need to do to break the fusion. Again, I don't think this is for PGs, but I've just mentioned it here. I have a video for this. I will show it to you in the end. Let's see. Okay, this one's working. So let me just tell you what this video is about. So this is a patient with an intermittent squint and I'm doing a cover and an uncover test, alternate cover test. The reason I'm showing you this video is that when she's looking at the distance, I'm able to break her fusion. But when she's, uh, when I'm trying to measure the squint from near, I'm not able to do it. And then how do we do that? We do the patch test. So see again. Huh? So first I'm doing for the, uh, this is the uncover test. You see, remove the cover and see that the eye has become exotropic. Now I'm doing the alternate cover test. Okay. That's the alternate cover test. Now I've combined it with prisms. But for near, you see there's no movement. In spite of me giving an accommodative target, there is no movement. Now what do I do? There is a squint for distance. There is no squint for near. Okay, see there's hardly any movement. 
Does this mean that there's no squint fund here? No. So what do I do? I simply patch. I don't allow her to open her eyes till I put the occluder. Now, again, I repeat with the accommodative target. And now you see that with a, now you see how the squint is there for near as well as for distance because I have broken the fusion with a patch test. So the take home messages for cover test, never use a torchlight examination. Don't mention it by mistake. Do not use, even if you've used a torchlight when you're doing it in front of the examiner, don't use a torchlight. Plan your surgeries after measuring the angles, uh, not based on your host book, but actually measuring the angles. And remember to observe the extra film movements and always document everything. You can draw pictures and you can document it. For all the cover, uncover, and alternate prism cover tests, patients have to have these four criteria. Most important is cooperation. Second is central fixation, good vision. All the tests must be done for distance and near, and all the tests have to be done with the patient's best corrected vision. So this is again a, a repetition of what I've just been saying. So motor examination is over, and we'll proceed to sensory examination. Now, sensory examination, I've just mentioned things here. You will have to read it because it's, it's a lot. But whatever little bit I, is there, I will explain to you. Suppose if they ask you what are the tests for suppression, then you're supposed to talk to them about word spot or test. A very easy test. It is uh, there with your Snellens chart and um, very easy to do this. The four prison days of test is used like the micropropias. Then you have your test for stereopsis. Why do we need to measure stereopsis? Stereopsis, in other words, is depth perception. And the common stereo charts that we have is a fitness fly test, the Langs test, the TNO, and the cyanapropor. The cyanapropor has become outdated, but support an old time examiner might ask you about the cyanapropor, you just have to read it. Mm, what I commonly use in my practice is the Langs test, which I have in my private practice. I don't have any stereo tests in uh, a government hospital, I don't have it. The tests used for uh, retinal correspondence is again cyanapropor and Bagolini glasses. Again, very theoretical. I myself have never seen a Bagolini glasses and I've never used one. So again, you'll just have to read it. I have a very simple textbook. I can pass it on to any one of the JJ students and you all can borrow it and Xerox. All of you can. It's a very simple book. These are the tests for stereopsis. Remember that the ones that I just mentioned were all uh, stereopsis, stereopsis tests for near, but you also have stereo, uh, stereopsis tests for distance. And the distance stereopsis is most required in intermittent divergence squint, and it's called as the BVAT system. Again, no one here, in it, at least in India, we don't have a distance stereopsis chart. The normal stereopsis you have to remember is 40 seconds. The lower your stereopsis, the better the stereopsis. The higher the stereopsis, the worse the stereopsis is. Another simple way of testing the stereopsis is 3D films. When you go for 3D films, you feel everything is coming no, towards your face. So that means you have good stereopsis. But if a child who does not in, uh, enjoy a 3D film, that means the stereopsis is poor. This is an example of your thickness fly test. It's a very easy test. It's given in, in your Kansky. Uh, this is the fly. This tests your gross stereopsis of about 3,000 seconds of arc. You have to ask the child, hold the wings of the fly. So, you know, it, it has this three-dimensional view. And you have to hold the wings of that. So if she touches the thing, that means she does not have stereopsis. If she, if she holds it in the hawa, that means yes, she's got stereopsis. Similarly, this is the animal chart test, and these are the circle bucket tests. So in this animal chart, now in the A row, B row, C row, one animal from these five is popping out, and they have to wear these uh, 3D glasses, and she has to identify which is the animal that's popping out. Now, based on uh, A, B, and C, there is a Table. And it says, okay, if she's identified the anim correct animal in the zero, then this much is her stereopsis. Similarly, these are four circles. One circle is popping out. And you have to find out which is that circle popping out. But the disadvantage of this test is that you need Polaroid glasses. Okay? And this is your Langs test. So Langs test, me kya hai na? Ke, uh, you have a star, you have a cat, and you have this uh, car. The advantage of the Langs test is that you don't require any Polaroid glasses. But the disadvantage is that it tests only up to 200 seconds of arc. It can't test beyond 200 seconds of arc. So here what you have to do, you, know, you hold the chart at a near distance, again with the patient's best corrected visual activity on. And you have to ask the child that what all can you see? Can you see the star? Can you see the cat? Can you see the car? 
depending on what she has identified at the back of the chart it's given that this if she identifies a cat then the stereopsis is 400 seconds of arc if if the star has been identified then it's up to 200 seconds of arc but remember the lang's test can only identify up to 200 200 seconds of arc not beyond so it's a good screening test now coming to the another important part of the examination we finished history we finished examination we finished eoms you're going to go in this order only then you do your motor test then you try and test your uh, your stereopsis if you have the chart available and after that the next thing that you go to is the retinoscopy most integral part of the examination what do i use for dilatation in jj we are using cyclopentolate and tropicasil plus i call this the ctc protocol what is the ctc protocol we use cyclopent um, one drop then i put another drop of tropicasil plus then i put one more drop of cyclo why do i have to use a tropicasil plus because it gives me a nice midriasis so it makes my retinoscopy a little easy cyclopent is a real cyclo uh, cycloplegic agent remember lot of times in lot of hospitals we are not using cyclopent at all and we are just relying on tropicasil t plus dilate with t plus T plus is not your cycloplegic agent. It is only your midriatic agent. So it's not correct to only dilate the patients with tropical C plus when you want to know do the retinoscopy for refracted errors. When when do I use atropin? I use atropin only when I have uh, suspect a case of accommodative esophagus, and in those patients in whom cyclopent is contraindicated. That leads to the next question. Where is cyclopent contraindicated? It is contraindicated in mentally challenged children. It is contraindicated in those children who have delayed milestones, who have history of convulsions. Then in those children, don't give cyclopent. Then you can probably use either atropin or even homide is is a good choice. Coming to the last part, you have to use the uh, you have to do the fundus examination. Why is the fundus examination important in any student? Now, if you take a look at this child, she has a right esotropia. She presented with a simple right esotropia. Her vision was around six thirty-six. If I hadn't seen the fundus, then I would have missed this fractional band that is there. And I don't have a peripheral picture, but she was actually a case of fibrous sclerosis, and in the periphery we saw astrocytoma. So this is very important to always check the fundus examination. Now, for example, another example: if you have a right esotropia and the fundus showed a macular scar. then you know that this is a sensory squint and that the visual prognosis is not good so therefore the fundus examination is a mandatory part for any squint examination similarly retinoscopy a lot of times in my own hospital i get references where uh, they've done the entire workup they've seen the fundus but they have forgotten to do the retinoscopy and then i've had to redilate the patients so therefore retinoscopy very 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 important for diagnosis of the squint now these are some of the common questions that are asked in the examination motor examination will speak of eoms and cover test sensory examination speak of fusion test and stereopsis visual acuity in children by itself is a full question or a short note laws of strabismus can be asked in the viva laws of strabismus are basics of squint you need to know this because other uh, if you don't know the law then you will not be able to identify a paralytic squint Uh, the sequelae of paralytic, paralytic strabismus is based on these laws, so you need to know them. So these are some of the common questions that is asked in the basic evaluation of strabismus. Okay. Now I have this quiz question. Can I go ahead with the quiz question? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So this was a child. Observe this child. Okay. Uh, make your observations of how he looks. Uh. i'm showing you something else here i'm showing you something else here identify what he has and and this was his fundus so can anyone guess what the diagnosis is i'm testing your power of observation and then should i unmute one of them ma'am little bit about your knowledge he complained of night blindness i'm not some of them exam going jo bhi ko pehchanta hai हाँ मैम ठीक है एनीबॉडी डॉक्टर वरुण कैन यू गेस एंड आंसर द क्वेश्चन हेलो डॉक्टर वरुण नो वरुण कम ऑन 
I'm, I'm yes. showing you again, okay? I'm showing how the exam goings again. Finger, sir. Don't you think there is some abnormality with the finger in the second thing? If you can just count them, you'll understand. Observe. Okay. I'm, huh? Okay. Even look at the face. See, he's short. He's stubby. He's got a round face. Okay. Count the fingers like what? How many fingers does he have? Um, and he complains of night blindness. Yes. And what is the fundus? What is this fundus picture? Describe it. What is it? This. What is this classic disc called? What? What is the? Anybody from other hospitals also? Whoever is there, soon? Yes. Exam going. There are many. When uh, I will just unmute Doctor Anubhav here. He has an answer. Dr. Anubhav, can you answer? Yeah, Dr. Anubhav. Uh, there is axial failure of the disc. Correct. Activation. Yes. The, uh, the bone speaking. So, what is the fundus picture suggestive of? Uh, a retinal disc. Fantastic. Okay. Now, I'll show you Thank the you. Uh, the other quiz questions which I had prepared. Now. So, I'll just show you that. Just give me a moment. Huh? Okay. Okay. Now, um, I'm going to show you this video and you have to identify what squint it is and what are the mistake I have made in this. Okay. I've made a mistake here. Observe. Okay. Is it isotropia? Isotropia is around four years of age. So, what is this thing? Retinoscopy, refractive error showing me a plus four. So, let me ask anybody randomly. Yeah, uh, Dr. Aditi Zoshi here. She has uh, yeah, raised her hand. Dr. Aditi Zoshi, do you want to answer the question? What is the mistake in the uh, video just now show? What, what, what? type of squint is this and what is a mistake that I have done in this video? Huh. No, sir. Hello. Yes, doctor. That was for previous session, I think. Uh, she she raised her hand for the for previous this. thing. Anybody wants to raise the hand for this one? I, can I show you the video again? See again. Very easy, yeah. Four, she's four years old. Retinoscopy showing a refractive error of plus four. Intermittent esotropia. And I made a mistake. Which I covered in this uh, uh, presentation, saying that please don't make this mistake. Uh, Dr. Vrinda, want to answer? Dr. Vrinda? Uh, sir, the refraction, so she's not been checked with the uh, best corrected visual acuity. No, no, no. I, she, th this is part of my examination that when I, when I saw the patient, she, uh, first time I noticed that it's plus four. So, what kind of squint is this? Intermittent esotropia with a high hyperopia is suggestive of? Accommodative easy. Correct, correct. And what's the mistake? What did I use for the near accommodative target? The finger. You used a finger. Is finger correct? No, you should use either a toy with a finer detail. Yeah, color. that's it. You've been listening to my lecture. Fantastic, Brinda. Which college are you from? Ma'am, uh, GMC Miraj. Are very good, very good. Super. Thank you. So that was a mistake that I made. I told you all that you should not use torchlight and you should use an accommodative target. That's my mistake. Okay, I'm going next. Okay, one second. Now I'm going to show you some extraocular movements and I want a JJ person to volunteer. Chalo. Who is going? Okay, what is this instrument used for vision testing? Dr. Anjali, would you like to answer this? Come on, come on. Um, Ones who are in the periphery have, should be should have read. What is this instrument? Optokinetic drum. Are, very good. Who is this person? Dr. Anjali, ma'am. Super. Ah, Sumit. Usko ek surgery. <laughs> okay. Very good. Optokinetic drum used to elicit vision and what else? Optokinetic nystagmus. Okay. Okay. One more question. Uh, maybe somebody from another college. Anybody can volunteer. Okay. 
Okay. This is the primary gaze of this child and you see that there is a tosis. Okay. Now I'm going to show you the next picture. What's the problem? This there's, okay, I'll give you a clue. The problem is obviously with the left eye. Can somebody tell me what the problem is? Dr. Sushrut, do you want to attempt this? It was for a previous question actually. Oh, still you can try for this. See, I'll show you the previous sure. slide. Uh, this is, there is a tosis. This side, left, I'll tell you, this, there is a tosis. There's a left hypotropia. That means the eye is a little bit down. Now I'm testing her extraocular movements. And you have to tell me what is wrong and in which eye. Okay, what, what muscle am I testing here? Tell me. In the right eye, what am I right testing? Inferior, uh, inferior oblique. Okay. Now, if, if my right eye is going up, should my left eye go up? Yes. Is it going up? No. No. So, which muscle is not working in the left eye? Left eye superior rectus is not working. Correct. And now similarly, uh, in this eye, she's abducting her eye and she's looking yes. up. So which muscle am I testing? Right eye superior rectus. Correct. Is this eye going up? Left, left eye would be superior inferior oblique, which is not working. If, so in the left eye, you told me that the superior rectus is not working and the inferior yes. oblique is not working. So what does she have? What are they? What are they? They are elevators, no? Yeah. So what is this? A double elevator palsy with palsy. a ptosis. And what is what is what did you notice about the ptosis? Okay. Does she have a true ptosis or does she have a pseudo ptosis? See again. This is how she was the totic leg. Now does she have a true ptosis or does she have a pseudo ptosis? Is the ptosis better when she fixes with this eye as compared to this? The ptosis here has improved when she fixes with the left eye. So therefore, the left yes. eye has a pseudotosis. Or maybe a, the ptosis is not as bad as what we saw in this picture. So that's another thing that you have to look. Now, yes. the reason why I gave this example is that whenever you have vertical, uh, whenever you have ptosis, always test the extraocular movements. If you have a combination of a ptosis along with a hypotropia, treat the hypotropia first and then go for the ptosis. Okay. Okay. okay, now I'm showing you something else. Wait. Now this is an easy one. So anyone can take it. Maybe the second year students can take it. It's a damn easy one. This is the primary gaze of the patient. He has a little exotropia. And I'm asking you to tell me which is the muscle under acting. It's very simple. Can anyone raise the hand who want to answer? Or I will choose a volunteer. <laughs> Rushab, Dr. Rushab, would you like to answer this? Dr. Rushab? Yeah, uh, yeah the, does it look like the medial rectus is... Uh, Absolutely, Rushab, which college? Which college are you? No, no, <laughs> no, no I am a pediatric ophthalmologist myself. I'm just... Uh, Are oh. yaar. <laughs> Okay, okay, then you should have said, nah, not to, you should have answered that. Okay, this is medial rectus under action. You see, uh, when he's looking in this direction, I'm testing the lateral rectus in this side, I'm testing the medial rectus in this side. Now I'm asking the patient to look in this direction. So here I'm testing the lateral rectus, but here the eye is not going. So he has a medial rectus problem. Okay, this is the primary gaze of the patient. Okay, and, and there is an exotropia here. This is this I actually I, I just wanted to show you. You can see in up gaze you see the V pattern. The eyes are diverging up like this. But again, when you're doing this, just this does not mean there's a V pattern. There has to be a difference between the primary gaze and the up gaze. And only if there's a significant difference of at least 15 to 20 prisms, then you can say, okay, this patient has a V pattern. And which muscle is overacting here and here? Come on, somebody other than any pediatric ophthalmologist, please answer. Any exam going candidate, please volunteer. It doesn't matter if you're wrong. Here is the time to make mistakes. Yeah. Nikita wants to answer. Just Nikita, answer. tell me. Inferior oblique overaction. In which eye? Inferior oblique. In which eye? Nikita, which eye? Nikita, can you hear me? Ma'am, I can't. In this... Uh, in, in, in both the eyes, you see now, if, if you have yeah. to test the inferior oblique, 
You see, when he is looking here in this direction, actually, I'm not asking him to look up. I'm only asking him to look laterally. And you see this upshoot here. So this is an inferior oblique in the left eye. Similarly, an inferior oblique in the right eye. And therefore, this patient had a B pattern. Okay. Okay. Anybody else? What's the diagnosis here? This is the primary gaze of this patient. There's an esotropia here. And then there is something here and here. So this, would anybody volunteer? Mm, he yes. had Doctor, a clueless congenital problem. Uh, Dr. Rupali here wants to answer. Ah, Rupali. Yes, Dr. Rupali. Yes. Speak loudly so that everyone can hear. Duans, Duans syndrome. Very good. Uh, if, if, if the child is looking here, there's abduction limitation here. In this direction, there's abduction limitation here. That's your narrowing of the palpable fissure, widening of the fissure on attempted abduction. Okay, and that's your leash effect. Now, leash effect mimics an inferior oblique overaction, but it's actually the upshoot which, which occurs in Duane syndrome. Okay, and now I will show you the videos. Okay. Um, Ma'am, there are four or five questions also which we yeah. have to answer. Go ahead, go ahead. Tell me the questions first. Okay. Pritam. Uh, there is a question. Can you please explain the head posture in the right superior oblique palsy? Right superior, see, superior oblique palsy is usually have a tilt. Okay. So uh, the, the head will be tilted always to the opposite side. I need the whole thing. The video. One second, uh, one minute. The video. Yes, ma'am. So, there are three videos in this. Uh, they minimize it from the fourth level. Uh, yeah, all these. Should I first finish off the videos? Yes, ma'am, we'll do. Not a problem. Okay. So, I'll show you the prism cover test video. Okay, so that's your prism bar. Uh, it's not visible. Uh, it's the, not visible? No, I, I can still see the presentation. The video okay, is not okay. started. One second, one second. The video is not visible. Uh, Madam, stop, share, and then reshare. Okay. Okay, now it's coming. Uh, yeah, ma'am, we can see the folder in which there are. Okay, that's the patient had an exotropia. That is your prism bar, and you do the alternate cover test. Okay, and when you're doing, you're seeing that the eye, the left eye is moving from outside to the center. Ma'am, excuse me, ma'am. Video is not uh, started yet. Like I can just see the. Uh, list of the videos over here. Oh. It's not getting played. Okay, I'll try again. Uh, one minute. Huh? Do the share screen again. Huh? I'll try one last time, otherwise I'll just... Okay, ma'am, no problem. Yeah. Just do the presentation, I'm working on the presentation. Right. Do the presentation. Just a minute. Do the slide. Slide, 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 slide. Okay. Here's the video. Okay, I, I don't know why it's not working in this form. I'll try again. Okay, we'll take that question. Superior oblique palsy, 
Okay. So suppose yeah. which which side? Suppose if you have a patient with a right superior oblique palsy, that means he has a right hypotropia and the hypotropia hypertropia in the primary gaze, which increases in the contralateral gaze and worsens in the same side head tilt. Therefore, in a right superior oblique palsy, the patient will have a left. The tilt is on the left side. How did I come to this conclusion? You have to do the three-step test that comes in paralytic stability. Okay, that I haven't discussed that in this lecture. So that will be the next. Whoever else will do paralytic strabismus can tell. But in a superior oblique palsy, the tilt is always on the opposite side. Okay. Then the next question is grading of the eye movements in case of actions of oblique muscles. Yeah, so it depends on the limbal uh, show. So uh, mainly like for superior oblique overactions or inferior oblique overactions, how much of the cornea is visible? Based on that, you have grade one, grade two, grade three, and grade four. Like suppose if you are doing an inferior oblique overaction, an inferior oblique overaction, may you, the eye completely goes inside and you can barely see the cornea. Then it's probably a grade four. The example that I showed you was probably a grade three. So it depends on how much of your cornea you are able to see. And then there is uh, can there be a term called as the dominance in alternate squint? How to identify or is it an obsolete term by now? No, no. There there is a term called okay. So old timers will use the term dominant, and there is a term called dominant. So dominant means I showed you now that uh, suppose if a patient has a right ectopia, and uh, although it may be an alternating squint, but the left eye is the one that she's using for vision. So the left eye is more dominant. The eye, if the if the vision is equal, then examination. If the vision, if the vision is equal, then you you then then the patient chooses which is the dominant eye, and most of the time the right-handed person will have a right side dominant. So if the vision is not equal, then the eye with a better vision is going to have uh, be the dominant eye most of the time. See, can you see now? Um, the video. Uh, is, yes, ma'am. Yes. The video has started. Okay, yeah. so that's your prism. I'm doing the cover test. The patient had an exotropia, therefore the base uh, is in, and the apex is towards the direction of the squint. And you're seeing that the eye is moving from outside to the center as I'm increasing the prism. The end point is still no movement occurs. It's still moving from outside to the center. Basically, looking at the eye under the prism, and now it has started moving in the opposite direction. See carefully; it's moving in the opposite direction. So, the where it was moving in the opposite direction—that's my uh, the angle. Okay. Yes. See again if you want. Alternate cover test with the prisms. It's moving from outside to the center. From twenty-five, I've gone to thirty. Moving outside to the center, outside to the center, and now you will see moving a flick movement from inside to the center now. Yep. Okay. Okay. So that's your. Prism cover test, and uh, the other ones I showed you, or uh, you the, yeah. So that these the, the, these were the two videos. Tell me, any other questions are there? Uh, yes, ma'am. Then um, during which test uh, we do comment on the dominance and the control, and when do we comment on them? So when you're doing the cover test, is when you say you know, the dominance. So cover tests I usually do right ectopia, prefer left eye fixation. That's how I typically write. You know, my squint ka jab when I'm writing na, I write it like this: the right ectopia with central steady maintained fixation. Uh, and there you can write left eye dominant. The moment I write, um, you know, one eye ectopia than the other eye dominant. Okay. I mean, actually, this dominant concept and all, I don't generally use it so much now. Okay, ma'am. Then, uh, for how long should we patch the eye before we break the fusion? Like, so how much time it takes to break the fusion before we so start? So, depends on how great the fusion and how good the fusion is. So sometimes in that intermittent divergence pain patient that I showed you the video, the patch was kept for about half an hour or one hour. 
Okay. But the important trick is that when you're removing the patch, don't let her open the eyes. You see in that video also I showed you when, when we removed the patch, her eyes were still closed. And only after I put the occluder did I ask her to open the eyes and we did the alternate cover. So about half an hour to one hour is enough. Okay. And then uh, how to measure a secondary and primary deviation and where do we uh, place the prism in each deviation to measure? Okay, so primary deviation is uh, the deviation with the uh, good eye fixing. And the secondary deviation is the deviation with the paralytic eye fixing. So you can keep the prism in front of any eye. The secondary deviation is always going to be more than your primary deviation. And again, this should be covered in paralytic splints. And then Dr. Divya here wants to know uh, that there uh, could be tropiophoria, but how do we check it in a mentally retarded or a very uncooperative child? Tropia means the child, the squint is visible, no? So whether mentally retarded or no mentally retarded, if, if the child walks in with a squint, it's a tropia. And phoria is, is a hidden squint. So in a mentally retarded child, it requires little experience, it requires little patience. Sometimes I also tell the caretakers or the parents that, uh, you know, I'm not able to elicit the squint. There have been times when the parents say that, no, there is a squint. It's a phobia, but I'm not able to elicit it. So in that case, I give the child the benefit of doubt and say, okay, we observe. And I tell the parents, take pictures at home. Whenever you see that the, the fusion has broken and the squint is visible, please take pictures and come back with the pictures. So like I said, always give the parents a benefit of doubt. Even if it's a pseudo squint, I always tell them, look, it looks like a pseudo screen, but I want to give you the benefit of doubt because you spend more time with the children. So come back to me again after one month, two months and take pictures. Keep taking pictures. Okay. Ma'am, in such a case, just to add a sub question, can we just do break uh, accommodation by giving cycloplegics and then look for it? Or that does not make no. sense? No, no, no. Cycloplegics don't break any uh, fusion. If you want to break the fusion, the only way you can break it is by patching the eye, which a mentally retarded child will not allow you. Okay. Cycloplegics don't break fusion. Okay, ma'am. Then, uh, why Dr. Aparna wants to know the unit of stereopsis is taken as seconds of arc and why uh -huh. this is so? I, I don't know that, man. <laughs> I've always learned it as seconds of arc. Okay. I don't know the physics behind it. I'm sorry. Okay, then how to differentiate between a fourth nerve palsy and a skew deviation? Ah, so that uh, fourth nerve, a skew deviation, uh, you'll have to do that three step test ka ek fourth step aata hai. to see if the hypertropia, hypertropia when, the, when the patient is lying down, na, you make the patient lie down and then you see whether the hypertropia increases or no. In a skew deviation, the hypertropia will increase. In a fourth nerve palsy, it will not increase. Okay, ma'am. And so that is that is the fourth step of the three step test. Again, comes under paralytic uh, presentation. But that's a good question. It's a good. I mean, somebody if your examiner is a uh, uh, strabismus person, then she would ask. Otherwise, don't worry. Normal examiner is not going to ask. From exam point of view, what you should know thoroughly are your cover test, uh, your extraocular movements, what their actions are, and how you have to elicit them. The laws, the two laws, those are very important. Okay. So many questions are on paralytic, ma'am. We might have to take one more lecture on the paralytic. Yeah, method. paralytic. One, one more question, ma'am. In Duan syndrome, is the globe retractions in the type 1, 2, and 3 is always during adduction only? Most of the time, yeah. Most of the time. Okay, ma'am. I think that covers the most of it. My other questions are all around the paralytic squint. Hmm. So I think uh, we, if, and we are taking another lecture. We uh, we will take care of yeah. the questions. Yeah, I, I think I think we should take it after. Uh, maybe give them a little break. Uh, what my advice to all of you is: exam going or not exam going? I've given you a little you know summary of this thing. The squint is very confusing. Uh, don't you know? Don't not read about this. Now, the next thing that you should do is open your Kansky. Refer to any simple book. Open your Kansky. Revise what I've just uh, taught you. Only then you will remember. Otherwise, again you will forget in no time. So, and this will come only by practice. So, don't don't worry. No tension. Uh, Sum I Sumit has my number. All the JJ people have my numbers. If anybody has any problems, I'm all the time free. I'm happy to answer and teach. And uh, I have this book, 
Sunit, I'll pass it on to you when I'm coming to JJ. Okay. Uh, अपने JJ students के लिए Xerox कर and tell the JJ students to pass it on to the other students. Will do. Very simple book. Uh, just Xerox it. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. So that will end it. Huh? Thank you, madam. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye, ma'am. Bye. Uh, the next lecture in the series will be on the Tuesday now, since we are doing every alternate day. It's Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. Tuesday we will be learning about uh, corneal ectasia, and that will be by Dr. Shraddha. So we'll meet on 8 p.m. on Tuesday. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Sapna sir. I will end the meeting now. Thank you. Thank you.